You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this, or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Annie in America. And I'm Johanna in Austria, and you're listening to your favorite international podcast. The podcast hosted by two online friends who never met in real life and who talk about murder, mystery, and the macabre throughout history. That's right. Before we get into today's episode, we'd like to give a huge shout out and a very big thank you to our newest Patreon member, Sherry Dawn Sheffield. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you would like to know more about Patreon and all about the ways to support us, not only through Patreon, but in ways that will cost you just a few moments of your time, please listen until the end because that's when we will tell you about that. That sounded accidentally like a pyramid scheme. It's not. It's not. It's, it's not. And five years later, we launched the cult. No. Nope. It's, we're just gonna, we're just gonna tell you how to, how to help the show. Okay. <laughs> it just sounded accidentally ominous. I hate things that are accidentally ominous. All right. Last week, we spoke about Bolivia and how in 1981, four young men made their way into the Amazonian rainforest. If you were able to take a look at the pictures that we put up in our Facebook album, you will know that these, am I wrong in saying that these were four handsome, strapping, young 80s men? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. were. Definitely. They were cute. Yeah, definitely. So they just looked like... If I met these four guys while well, I was their age-ish and backpacking, they are people that I would have wanted to get to know. They all seemed interesting, yep. and they have nice faces. So, today we're going to tell you how that expedition continued and what became of the four men. But we have a little bit of news for you, and some of you are going to be thrilled about this, and some of you are not. This is part two of three. We just realized that... We need one more episode to do this tale of survival justice. We're not here to do hours and hours and hours of research and then tell you, like, some of the things. No, we want to tell you all of the things, or as much as we can. So, if you haven't listened to last week's episode, episode 223, Please go back now and listen to that one first. It will give you not only the first part of the story, but also a bunch of background info on the country. And if you did already listen, but you just want a super quick refresher, Johanna has you covered. I feel like that's our next, that's, gonna, that's when we launch our line of like really nice bathing suit cover-ups and kimonos <laughs> and things. <laughs> Johanna has you covered. Yossi Ginsberg, born in Tel Aviv in 1959 to Holocaust survivor parents, developed a fascination with adventure stories from a young age, notably inspired by Henri Charrier's autobiography Papillot. Charrier's daring escape attempts from Devil's Island left a lasting impression on Yossi. In 1981, at the age of 22, Yossi, who had just served three years in the Israeli Navy, embarked on a South American journey, intending to follow in Papillot's footsteps. He met Markus Stamm, a Swiss backpacker in Peru, and their friendship flourished. The two new friends traveled on to La Paz, Bolivia, where Yossi and Markus encounter Kevin Gale, an American photographer, and later Karl Ruprechter, an Austrian geologist. Carl, claiming extensive Amazonian knowledge and previous encounters with an undiscovered indigenous tribe, proposes an expedition. Yossi, Markus and Kevin eagerly agree to join despite Carl's later admission of a time constraint due to family obligations. Undeterred, Yossi convinced Carl to serve as a paid guide for them on a modified expedition. The group commenced their journey on 4th of November 1981, that's when they flew out of La Paz to Apollo. From Apollo, they start their adventure, following the Twiki and Azariamas rivers. Encountering challenges such as rain, food scarcity and difficult terrain, tensions grew within the group. Marcus's ethical concerns and caution, coupled with problems like wet footwear causing potential jungle rot or trench foot, exacerbated the strain. 
As Carl's Kaube boots disintegrated, the group faced a critical decision. Continue or return to Asariamas for new supplies. Marcus is absolutely for turning around, Iossi, still eager to encounter indigenous tribes, wants to continue, and Carl doesn't care one way or the other. Ultimately, Kevin's pragmatic perspective led them back to Asariamas for regrouping. And that's pretty much where we left off last week, the group deciding to turn around and head back to the settlement. The way back to Asariamas was a bit easier for the four, despite them having trouble with shoes, feet, and hunger. But the good thing is that it was a lot of downhill on trails that they had just made a short while earlier, so they were sort of backtracking the easier way, right? Once back in Asariamus, they healed their wounds, fixed their cowboy boots, and talked about what to do next. Yossi was still not ready to give up the whole trip, even though it was clear by now that they would not have enough time to go and look for this tribe. They decided that they could still make the best of their trip and build a raft and float down the Asariamus River, almost all the way to Ruurenabak where they would be able to take a plane back to La Paz. The plan for Marcus was to put him on a mule and send him back to Apollo, from where he could return to La Paz, where they could then all meet up again. That sounded sinister, but wasn't. Like, put him on a mule, send him back to Apollo from whence he can return. But then it's fine. They're all going to just, hey, get back together. And then they figure if they're still friends at that time, they'll meet up again. That sounds like a solid plan, right? So the locals start to build a raft for the four adventurers while they refueled and healed their wounds. Carl also invited Kevin and Yossi to his uncle's ranch that was apparently, allegedly, located not far from Rurenavake. But only a couple of days later, he told Yossi, Sorry, friend, you can't come visit my uncle with me. I completely forgot. To mention just this very small fact that he is a Nazi who came here after World War II, and I don't think it would be a pleasant visit for you. Yeah, I think yeah. that's safe to assume with uh, the you son think? Of Holocaust survivors. Yeah, right. Red flag number one. Red flag with a swastika, even. So. This trip doesn't happen, and Yossi starts to notice how Carl's stories change all the time, sometimes just a little bit, but in a way that made him feel increasingly uncomfortable. Do you think Yossi thought that Carl was the kind of person who always wants to appear grander than they are? Mm -hmm. Or do you think he might have felt that all his stories were complete lies? Because, I mean, to be fair, an elderly Austrian Nazi living in Bolivia is rather believable. Mm Mm-hmm. It's not known how many high-ranking members fled to countries like Brazil, Argentina, or Uruguay, but it's estimated that it must have been several hundreds. The most notorious ones were, of course, Adolf Eichmann and Josef Mengele, among others. Right. Yeah, that's the thing. It could be true. And I guess it could explain a lot of the uncomfortable factor with Carl, because maybe he's then just saying, oh, well, this, this is somebody who obviously has a lot to hide. If his family are all, like, Nazi war criminals on the run in foreign countries, then that could explain, like, why he has this shady kind of vibe about him all the time. That would, to me, that would make sense. You know what I mean? Because then if I meet somebody associated with a group of people that I find horrific, then I will immediately, you know, it's that guilt by association thing. Yeah, also it was only like uh, not even 40 years after the war had ended and there's definitely been a lot of tension between uh, Israel or or Jewish people in general and Austrian and German people. Sure. Oh yeah, of course. Of course. So I think that he took advantage of that. I wonder if that was a calculated choice or not. And I think you just have to be wary, right? So they spend the next few days at the settlement, and while there, they are waiting for their raft to be completed, and they not only stock up on provisions and fix their equipment and regain their strength, but Carl also shows them how to look for gold. But they only found a little bit of gold in the form of flakes and just a few really small pieces. And then something happened. Marcus changed his mind. He met the mule, and he was like, nope, (laughs) no thank you. I don't know. But whatever happened, 
he decided that he didn't want to go back to Apollo on a mule, that he actually would like to join them on their trip down the river. That came as a huge surprise to Yossi and Kevin, but probably not a big surprise to Carl. I think what had happened was that Yossi and Kevin were more of a unit, and Marcus felt alone, isolated, and like his friends had turned against him. And now pretty much the only one in the group who was left to bond with was Karl Ruprechter. Maybe not bond, but Marcus definitely spent more time talking to him now that his friends were kind of only hanging out with each other. I'm not sure if Karl had convinced Marcus to stick around or if it was more of a subconscious influence, but I'm absolutely sure that Karl's stories were one of the main reasons why Marcus decided he wanted to join them. And maybe also because he didn't want to lose his friends completely. Maybe he felt that if the two were on this adventure together without him, he would be even more of an outsider to them. And maybe also he didn't want to be seen as weaker than them. Yeah, I think any slash all of that, a combination of that, it just all makes yeah, sense. Yeah. It all makes sense. It's just human nature. Yeah, definitely. So finally the raft was ready. They packed up provision. They got 10 pounds of rice, 7 or 8 pounds of dried beans, green plantains, cucumber, sugarcane syrup, salt, chilies, some spices. All these things were valuable in the settlement because they were rare. And to restock them, the locals would need to travel to Apollo. So the four adventurers had to trade in things they had, and Karl Rupprechter was the one in charge of that, because he was supposed to be the most experienced one, right? The one with most authority when it came to these things. But Karl may have paid too much for their provision. He traded in most of their fishing line and fishing hooks, as well as most of their lighters. By the end, they only had one lighter left. Uh, and that one was half full, three fishing hooks and a few yards of fishing line. After one last festive dinner at the settlement, they started their river rafting trip down the Tweaky the next day. It was decided that Carl was going to be the one in charge, again, because he was the most experienced one. Kevin and Marcus were placed in the back of the rafts to steer and move the raft forward with the help of two poles, and Yossi was sitting next to Carl, also holding a long pole, that he should use to keep them from colliding with rocks. Marcus thought that the poles the locals had prepared for them were too long and therefore hard to handle, so Carl simply shortened them. The big problem though, he shortened them too much and now Marcus and Kevin were unable to use them to navigate. The poles just couldn't reach the ground anymore. Damn it, Carl. It's so funny how they think they know better than the locals who do that all the time, but okay. Right, yeah. Yeah, Carl especially, yeah, everybody is, yeah, this whole thing is great. It's a lot of mansplaining to each other, to each other. but they're all, everybody's wrong. <laughs> uh, so Carl told them to simply use the poles as an oar, and Kevin just about had it with all this nonsense and told Carl that it's impossible to use a round pole as an oar, to which Carl replied, do as I say. So, yeah. But people love that. That always really... <laughs> because I say so. That's a great so. response. Yeah, because I said so. But the river was nice and slow, and so far it was a smooth ride. But soon they came to some larger rocks, and when they tried to navigate them, Marcus lost his pole, and Yossi couldn't manage to push the raft from the stones, which caused the raft to collide and almost tilt. But thank God only almost. But now, all of a sudden, they were no longer in quiet waters. The river grew wilder and wilder, and they basically collided with every rock that crossed their way, which put Carl in severe panic mode, because turns out he couldn't swim. Damn it, Carl. Marcus lost the spare pole, the only spare pole they had. Then Yossi lost his pole, and overall none of this was great. But at last they managed to reach the shore. This is a little excerpt from Yossi Ginsberg's book, and it paints a really good picture of how frustrated everyone in this group was at this point. So, Yossi writes, quote, We can't go on like this, Carl said. It's terrifying. Not one of you has the vaguest idea how to handle a raft. Take it easy, Carl. Take it easy, Kevin said. Nobody learns how to do this in an hour. We'll get more practice. We'll catch on. Everything will be all right. This isn't child's play, Kevin, Carl retorted angrily. We don't have time for lessons. I could be killed. You have to follow my instructions quickly without hesitation. All right, Carl, Marcus said. We'll do just as you say. Tell him that you'll do what he says, Kevin. Please, say it. This is, this is healthy 
This is a healthy relationship right here. I mean, I have to say in these kind of situations, you need a leader and you you should pick one that you trust to follow. And then you really shouldn't start questioning the leader all the time, though. It's true. It's true. A hundred percent. It's true. All right. I'll follow your instructions, Kevin conceded reluctantly. Carl took, this is still, still quoting. Carl took the machete and went into the jungle. He swiftly lopped off a few long branches and made four new poles. Then he sketched a raft in the sand and explained how we should deal with various situations. He showed us how to paddle with the pole and how to use it to push off from the river bottom without letting the river take it away. He showed me how to hold the end of the pole under my arm when absorbing a blow so as not to risk breaking a rib from the impact. Back on the river, there were fewer rocks, and we were getting used to it. Right, Carl yelled, and we all rowed, and the raft nudging over to the right. Good, now left. We practiced until we thought we had the hang of it, but whenever we came to a difficult pass or a bend in the river, Carl started yelling like a maniac. Marcus turned white. Kevin got angry, and I hid my fear under a mask of absolute indifference. Fortunately, none of us was hurt or slipped into the river. Yossi, come trade places with me, Marcus said. You should get some practice back here in the stern. Good for you, Marcus. Good thinking, I thought sarcastically. Any minute now and Papa will give you a nice pat on the head. But I did as he said. He took up my position next to Carl, and I went aft. He doesn't know the first thing about whitewater rafting, Kevin said to me. Believe me, we're doing everything ass backward. Who ever heard of trying to row with a round pole? Is he putting us on? I suspected Kevin of holding a grudge against Carl for having yelled at him. I still believed that Carl knew what he was talking about. End quote. Basically, at this moment, everybody is against everyone except for Carl. He's like oblivious that anybody could question his knowledge. Yeah, Carl is Team Carl. Okay, so for a while the ride was serene again and the water was smooth and they all calmed down and started to enjoy the scenery and the wildlife they managed to see. And soon they rode to the shore once more to settle for the night. Carl once more lectured them on how he was the only one who knew how to steer a raft and that the three were putting all of them in danger and that the river would grow more and more dangerous from now on with several passes full of rapids they needed to get through and waterfalls they needed to avoid. Kevin, on the other hand, was certain that Carl had absolutely no idea what he was talking about. He told Yossi that he was sure that the pass wasn't as dangerous as Carl made it out to be and that the two of them, so Kevin and Yossi, would be able to navigate the raft through. Sounds a bit pompous in my opinion, to be honest. Yeah, I think pompous is a is a solid description of that situation. Yeah. So Carl and Kevin agree that it would be a good idea to find some balsa trees and cut oars out of the wood. And so they go look for balsa, find some, and Carl is like, okay, I'm going to cut this in the middle, and then I'm gonna cut them in shape. And Kevin is super annoyed already, and he's like this snarky person in high school who just rolls their eyes at everyone's suggestion. And he turns to Yosa and he whispers, yeah, sure, Jen, I want to see how he will manage to do that. Uh, But guess what? Carl might not be able to swim, but he's apparently super awesome at using the machete to cut wood. And he just does what he said he would do and thus shuts Kevin up for a while. But not for long, because as soon as Carl sets out to hunt some game, Kevin has the great idea to take the raft and glide through the pass that doesn't look so dangerous at all, and he thinks it will be easy peasy. Marcus is against it, but also doesn't want to be left out once more, and so the three get on the raft, enter the pass that doesn't look so wild at all. But guess what? Carl was actually right and Kevin was wrong. The pass has many rapids, and the raft gets knocked against all kinds of big rocks. Marcus and Yossi even fall off and hold on for dear life. But they make it through, and Kevin is like, told ya, wasn't so hard. And all three of them are super excited that they made it through without Carl's help. Once they meet up with Carl at the camp and tell him that the raft is already on the other side of the pass and that it was no problem at all, Carl is like, yeah, that's nice. Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) Damn it, Carl. All right. So over the next days, they encountered pretty much more of the same. Smooth waters and then rapids. 
But even though Yossi, Marcus, and Kevin started to get a better hang of it, Carl was growing more and more annoyed and anxious because of their lack of skill in navigating the raft through the river. And the group dynamic was also getting worse and worse. Marcus was still troubled by the infectious rash on his feet. We speculated last week that it could have been a few different things. Kevin and Yossi would often refuse to help Carl with chores that needed to be done, making Marcus feel like more of a burden because he couldn't be of any help, and then Carl would get angry because he felt like Yossi and Kevin treated him like their servant. It always took some convincing to get one of them to give the Austrian geologist a helping hand. At one point, Yossi followed Carl into the thicket, I think hunting or looking for firewood, and Carl flat out told Yossi that he had about had it and that they had had their fun, but now it was time to go home. And he was going to end the entire expedition, and he expected the three young men to follow him to a close-by settlement on foot. And so immediately Yossi's like, okay, fine. And Kevin and Marcus are like, great, fantastic, let's, let's end this now. But pretty soon, Kevin whispered to Yossi that they should not follow Carl, but that they should instead use the raft down the river as they had planned. He was still convinced that it couldn't be that dangerous if they would just let the water carry the raft through the dangerous pass. Marcus had kind of a feeling that Kevin planned on going through the pass on the raft and told Yossi that he wanted to join them if that was the plan. But Yossi pretended he didn't know what was going on, and he was like, uh, I don't know, I have no idea what Kevin wants to do, I'll go talk to Kevin and let you know. And then, obviously, he just immediately went to Kevin and said, Marcus wants to join us, and Kevin was like, "Uh uh-uh, he can't come with us. Is that not something like um, a high school joke he can't sit with us? I was just going to say, it's so high school, right? Because then does he go back... So then Yossi, right? It's so clicky. And I think it's just a a bothersome aspect of human nature, maybe, because it's not even like these are four Americans. Like, these are four people from different parts of the world, and we're still Lord of the Flies in it a little bit. You know, it's like, you can't just spend a week together and sort this out and be on your way. It Honestly, it makes me really sad, but it also annoys me a lot because it really sounds like the worst high school drama ever. The worst. Yeah. The worst. So now Yossi goes to Marcus, and just to remember, he is manipulating Marcus now. And he basically says, listen, I just asked Kevin, and he just only told me now. I had no idea, but he wants to go on the raft all by himself. And I really think this is dangerous. And one of us should go with him. I just personally would prefer to go with Carl because I've had it with all this adventuring. This is all a lie. Um, But he's, this is what Yossi is saying to Marcus. And he's saying, you know, I would be willing to sacrifice myself to help Kevin. But your feet are so bad. I really think you should go on the raft with Kevin. And Marcus is like, wait, wait, wait. No, I do not want to go with Kevin. Not just the two of us, because Kevin hates me. Why can't we just all go on the raft, the three of us? To which Yossi responds that they can't leave Carl all by himself. So Marcus decides he will go with Carl, and Yossi will stay with Kevin. And now everything is said and done, and they can finally tell Carl that only Marcus will be joining him. And Carl was actually okay with that. He just once more warned them about the dangers of the river. He once more told them they couldn't make it through the pass. Well, we keep calling it pass. It was it was a dangerous canyon that they would encounter. And that they needed to stop before they entered the canyon. Then they would need to disassemble the raft. One of them needed to walk around to the other side of the canyon. And at an agreed upon time, the one still with the parts of the raft would let the parts go one by one. And the parts would make their way through the pass. And the one waiting on the other side would have to catch them as they came floating by. And then they would just have to reassemble everything. But Carl very much doubted that this was a viable option for just two people and two inexperienced people at that. So instead, he told them to stop the raft before the canyon and just leave it there. They would have to go on foot 
Then, on the other side of the canyon, they would need to make a new raft. They should be able to find cut-down logs in Kuri Playa, an at the time of the year abandoned miner's settlement. With that, they started to divide the equipment between them. Kevin and Yossi would take the machete, the fishing lines and hooks, and most of the provision, as well as the nylon tarps. Carl and Markus took the shotgun and the ammunition and the tent. Kevin also asked Marcus to take his rolls of film, his tripod and some other camera stuff that wouldn't be safe on a raft. With that, the two groups spoke their farewells. Once more, Carl warned Yossi and Kevin to not go into the canyon, they wouldn't be able to make it through. And he also told them that if something would happen, they should under no circumstance separate. This is again a little excerpt from the book. Quote, Stay together, no matter what, even if one of you is hurt and can't walk. Don't ever leave the other behind in order to go for help. If one of you gets hurt, do anything you can to make it to the riverbank and wait there. Whoever is uninjured will take care of the other and get food for him until help arrives. As long as you stay on the riverbank, there's always the chance of help arriving. Carl promised that if we didn't arrive in Rurenabake by the 15th of December, he would notify the authorities and make sure that they came looking for us. End quote. Then the men shook hands, promised to meet up in La Paz and be all good friends again. Then they waved goodbye and went separate ways. After Marcus and Carl were gone, Yossi and Kevin started working on the raft. They made some repairs, tried to improve some things and made sure everything was tied down securely. Then they rearranged the equipment they had left in their two backpacks. One was the bigger pack that held most of their equipment. A pot, utensils, clothes, sandals... The second, smaller pack, held what they considered essentials, things they needed to survive. First aid kit, lighter, mosquito repellent, their map, and this was all put in a rubber bag to protect everything from getting wet. Kevin also used two large, empty but sealed cans, I assume they were like with screw-on lids, I guess, and Mm -hmm. he ties those to the essential rubber bag. These empty cans were supposed to keep the bag floating if they were to lose it. After they took all the necessary preparations and went through the campsite one more time to make sure they didn't leave anything they would need, they jumped onto the raft and off they went. They let the current take lead of the raft and were expecting to reach the entrance of the canyon where they had planned on stopping later that day. Pretty soon, they encountered the first problems. Strong currents and large rocks made it impossible to navigate the raft. All they could do was hold on for dear life while the raft hit each and every rock formation in that river. But finally they made it through and soon they were drifting through quiet waters again. They were even able to enjoy the sights. The steep rocks on the sides of the river, the waterfalls they passed, the greenery, some butterflies, and I'm sure it was absolutely amazing. Still wouldn't go there. So soon they arrived at what looked to them like the mouth of the dangerous canyon, the dangerous pass they had been warned about, and they were getting ready to stop at the spot that Carl had told them about. But there was a problem, they couldn't find it. Where the hell was it? The current grew stronger and the raft was drawn closer and closer to the entrance of the canyon. And then they hit a large rock head on and the raft was hanging on the rock at a 60 degree angle while Yossi and Kevin were dangling on the sides holding onto the raft with all their might. And the water was crashing around them and there was just no way they could move the raft from the rock. To their left side was a waterfall with a 12 feet drop and on their right side was the riverbank. The only chance they had was to try and reach that riverbank. So outdoorsy Kevin decided that it would be best if he jumped in and tried to reach the bank. He was a very good swimmer. And then Yossi was supposed to throw the machete over to him and Kevin would then go and cut down vines as ropes and they could use the ropes to pull Yossi and the packs to safety. So Kevin did as he said, he jumped into the water and he actually manages to reach the safety of the riverbank. And Yossi throws the machete but that was pretty much the last thing he was able to do, because by that time, the raft had started to move and to dislodge from the rock. And all Yossi could hear was Kevin yelling, hold on tight, as the raft was drawn towards the waterfall. And with that, Yossi and the raft were gone, and Kevin was all alone on that riverbank. Now, everyone knows way more about Yossi's side of the story because of the book he wrote later on. So here comes the big spoiler. 
Yossi and Kevin both would survive the jungle, and we will tell you all about Yossi's ordeal next week in the third and final part of Lost in the Jungle. But there were never more details about how Kevin managed to get out of there. We read that Kevin ultimately wrote a book too, but we tried to find it without any luck. It was published in 2019 and may have only been published in some countries. We're not exactly sure, but we did find an interview that Kevin gave in March 2018. It's an article in Ami magazine titled Lost in the Jungle, the Untold Story of Kevin Gale. It was written by Isaac Katz, and this following is just a small part of that article that we will, of course, provide a link to in our sources. This is what Kevin had to say, quote, I was horrified as I watched my buddy Yossi fall into the river. I tried to jump in and pull him out, but the river suddenly turned into a whirlpool. I've been swimming since I was a child, but I've never been threatened by such a strong current. It was so easy to get sucked in. I felt like I was drowning. It was the first time in my life that I was afraid of water. I was faced with a choice. Should I save my own life and return to the village where our ill-fated adventure had begun? Or should I cross to the other side of the rapids and look for Yossi? I decided upon the latter. My conscience wouldn't allow me to abandon him. Getting to the other side, however, involved swimming or wading through an awful lot of water, some of which was stagnant. I knew from experience that I had to be very careful about my feet, keeping them as dry as possible, and trying to avoid stepping on sharp stones and branches. But I was in a hurry to find my friend, so I wasn't as careful as I should have been. There was hardly anything to eat. Sometimes I would look for birds and eat the few eggs I found in their nests. All I had with me was my machete, which I used if I came upon a small animal. With every passing day, I felt myself getting weaker. I did everything I could do to conserve my energy, but it was very hard to find shelter and to keep myself warm at night. By the morning of the fifth day, my feet were in terrible pain and getting worse. They were covered with blood and oozing pus from all of my missteps, and I couldn't walk any more. I could barely stand. I realized that I had to get off my feet or they would never heal. There was no choice but to float downriver, despite the dangers. I didn't have the strength to build a raft, so I found a fallen tree trunk, climbed on, and let myself drift along the water. The current was very swift. If I didn't find a way out of the jungle soon, I knew I would die. A short time later, I was shocked to see two indigenous men walking single file on the opposite bank. One of them was carrying a rifle. I started shouting to them in Spanish, Ayudame! Ayudame! Help me! I can't walk, and I'm lost. I was so grateful they were able to grab hold of the tree trunk and pull me to shore. It turned out that they lived in the village of San Jose, the same village we had been searching for. End quote. So, Kevin Gale spent a little over five days alone in the Bolivian jungle in the rainforest before he was rescued. That is a very long time under such circumstances. That's too many days. It's too many days. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But what about Yossi? What happened to him once the raft was pulled off the rock with him holding on as hard as he possibly could? Well, the raft was quickly caught in an undertow pulling it underwater, and Yossi still holding on, not wanting to let go. The raft was pulled up to the surface again, and the last thing Yossi saw of Kevin was how his friend tried to run after him. But then Yossi was pulled into the canyon. And this canyon was, or still is, called the San Pedro Canyon. I've seen some sources state that it was the Devil's Cauldron, but that's not correct. I looked and I looked, trying to find an exact description of the canyon San Pedro, so that I could tell you what made it so dangerous, but all I could find was info that you can book some tour there nowadays to visit the canyon, but that was mostly about it. All I found was that it was basically, or that it is basically at some spots rather narrow and steep with a bunch of waterfalls and extremely dangerous rapids pulling you towards large rocks. So 
It sounds like there's basically almost no chance to make it through unless you're an extremely experienced local. At least that's how I understand it. And that's where Yossi finds himself now, still holding on to the raft that made its wild dance through the rapids. But not for long. Uh, Yossi is thrown off the raft several times, each time he manages to climb back on. And he loses the packs. But finally, finally, he manages to leap off the raft as he is close to the river shore and he lands on solid ground. Yossi Ginsberg had actually survived and he was back on land. But what now? Where was Kevin? How was he supposed to find his friend? And how were they supposed to survive without their packs? Would they be able to find each other again? And would they find their way to the nearest settlement? That's the questions Yossi probably had in his head at that time. Well, we already know what happened to Kevin. And we know Yossi survived. But what you out there don't know yet is how did he survive? How long was his ordeal? And what became of Marcus and Carl? Did they make their way to La Paz and realize their bodies were still missing? Well, that's what we'll tell you next week in the third and final part. I promise we will finish this story next week. That's right. Something good? My something good is that at the time you're listening to this episode, I'm actually on a trip to Sarajevo, which I'm very excited for because it's going to be my first trip in over three years. My last trip was also to Sarajevo way like january 2020 something like yeah. that yeah yes so oh we were such sweet innocent yeah. naive babies back then <laughs> that was my last trip i took anywhere since then yeah nothing so yeah i'm really looking forward to it i still need to pack but it's gonna be good that's awesome how about you? I went to my first drag king show, which was really fun. I've never seen a king show before, which was women dressing up. And this one had a theme. And so it was Freddie Mercury. And it was so much fun. I'm going to post some more info on my socials. Just met some really fantastic, talented people and had such a good time. It was really, really fun. And you didn't want to go because you didn't feel... Great that day, but you enjoyed it, I think. I did. I didn't feel good, and I didn't, I just was struggling to leave the house, but I hadn't seen these friends in too long, and I'd been looking, I'd completely forgotten about this, and then kind of remembered, so I'm just really glad I went. It was, it was just a nice time with good friends, and it was at the, um, oh, the Summer Shack in Cambridge, so I'll post more info for local peeps, because it's a regular thing. And I think I'll probably be returning to it. But yeah, it was it was a good time with good people. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah. If you enjoyed this episode, and that's the kind of thing um, where you can support our podcast and it really takes just a couple of minutes of your time. Yes. Please go to your podcast app and check if you leave us a rating and or review we really do appreciate that yes another thing you can do is share our content tell your friends about it share it in facebook groups or wherever you are on social media reddit you know oftentimes people will ask for podcast recommendations and you see the same five podcasts they are great don't get me they're wrong great, but they recommend but like, it over and over again yeah we all know those podcasts yeah Maybe you want to recommend us once in a while, if it's fitting. If somebody's looking for a murdery, mystery, history podcast, I mean, what else would you recommend, yes. right? If they this hate, and the art of crime. If they hate women's voices, if they hate facts. Banter. We don't even have that much banter. We did, yeah, like, early but... on, because I honestly, I thought we were going to do 10 episodes and no one would ever listen to them. I was wrong. Yeah, so that would help us out a lot. Yeah. Or you can join our Patreon, go to patreon.com, check everything out. The next murder tier get together is going to be on 30th. Uh, we're going to be talking about Natalia Grace. That's right. And we're preparing for our next interview with a guest for the Tell Me Everything segment. I'm very excited for that. Excited isn't the right word because it's such a heavy, difficult subject, but it yes. is going to be very compelling and it, all the feels, all the feels. I just feel so honored that she agreed to talk to us. Me too. Very, very much so. Yeah. Go to our webpage, freshhellpodcast.com. There you find all the links, all the email 
uh, which is freshshowpodcast at gmail.com. All the PO box links, the merch store links. We have some really good designs, nice designs, fun designs. You can look around there. And that's it. Please tell all your pets who said hi. Hug them, cuddle them, love them, take them to the vet. Help all the animals. If you find an animal in distress, in need, try to help. And not only be kind to animals, be kind to humans, your fellow human beings out there. As Annie said last week, we're all in it together and uh, the world is the enemy, not the other humans yeah. most of the time. Treat life like the blackjack table. Like just work together to beat the dealer, everybody, okay? Could you please? Perfect, perfect. <laughs> Love it. And uh, the most important and hardest thing, be kind to yourself. Oh, that's the worst. That really is the worst. It's fine. We're working on it, right? So, yeah. as Churchill once famously said, if you're going through hell, keep going, just like Yossi and Kevin. Tschüss. Bye-bye. <laughs>